good morning. It is great to see so much red out there. You notice our shades of red are all a little bit different, but they're still red. God's church is like that. It's one, but everything is just a little bit different. Everybody's been given a little bit different gift than everybody else. So the same, but different. Let us worship God together. We have come here to sing of God's awesome spirit. He had come as the people of faith and offered praise and thanks to God, the Lord of God. Fill our hearts now, great God, with the fruits of your wondrous spirit. Let us sing together, Spirit of the Living God. of love, come and renew us, chase away our doubts and light a holy fire in our words and deeds. Holy God, fire and dove, come to your church, inflame our compassion, enlarge our witness and strengthen our hospitality. Holy God, breath of joy, renew our worship, touch our hearts, bring us peace. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to say, pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 104. O Lord, what a variety of things you have made. In wisdom you have made them all. 
the earth is full of your creatures. The air is the ocean, vast and wide, teeming with life of every kind, both large and small. See the ships sailing along and Leviathan, which you made to play in the sea. All depend on you to give them food as they need it. When you supply it, they gather it. You open your hands to feed them, and they are richly satisfied. But if you turn away from them, they panic. When you take away their breath, they die and turn again to dust. When you give them your breath, life is created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord continue forever. The Lord takes pleasure in all he has made. The earth trembles at his glance, the mountains smoke at his touch. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God to my last breath. May all my thoughts be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our next event will be Saturday's men's breakfast at 8 a.m. And the projects will be ready for you after breakfast is over. Monday will be our governing board meeting. And then following the, that, the 20th and 21st is the rummage sale. But you have to get ready for the rummage sale. So there will be work going on in these next two weeks. Um, our first cookout of the summer will be June 21st. We will be having it on the North Lawn this year so that the grass well, it's not sprouted yet, so the purpose was so that the grass would have a chance to grow on the South Lawn. And on June 29th will be Children's Day with some pretty special activity going on that day. Right, girls? Yes. Um, just to say it out loud, we had our mission for May was cookies, but we still need more cookies, so that will be ongoing. And the box cookies you can bring in any time, whether it's part of our mission for that month or not. But uh, just to let you know, we'd like to have more cookies before we deliver them to them this time. Our pastor's biography is our 11th pastor, the Reverend Myron Munson Dean. He was born in Moncton, Vermont in November 8, 1811, the son of Charles Dean and Loretta Munson. And uh, he married uh, Harriet Carpenter Moriarty uh, in 1839 in Boston. Uh, she was born in Salem and they had uh, eight children uh, over a 20-year period between 1840 and 1860. He uh, attended Middlebury College in Vermont where he got his, uh, in 1834 he graduated with an AM and AB degree. He attended Brown University, class of 1837, and he graduated Newton Theological Institution in 1838. Uh, while he was at Brown, he was ordained a Baptist minister in 1836. His first church, his first pastorate, was with the Third Baptist Church of Providence, where he enjoyed a revival of religion, and the results of which were in addition to the church of more than 100 converts. He remained in Providence for three years, when he accepted a call to Marblehead, Massachusetts, where he continued seven years. He had trouble with his eyes, and that obliged him to lay aside his ministerial work for a time, and when his health was somewhat recovered, he accepted an appointment as agent of the Publication Society, the American, Publication, American Baptist Publication Society, and afterwards the American and Foreign Bible Society. And it was then that he decided that he could continue his ministerial work, and he accepted the call to the pastorate of Warren, uh, in his own notes, in his own handwriting, in the uh, uh, 
what he wrote for the uh, uh, history of Rhode Island. Uh, he said that he started uh, in Warren March 1st, 1854, and his ministry continued until July 27th, 1855, a little bit more than a year. And he had to resign here because he was having trouble with his eyesight, with his vision again. So it was for the same reason. The last years of his life were devoted to secular business. Uh, he died March 30th, 1861. <clears throat> he was uh, 49 years old uh, when he passed away. Uh, and his wife, Harriet, uh, lived until 1893. And just as a side note, a little uh, genealogical research. Um, Reverend Myron Munson Dean is the seventh cousin six times removed of Pastor Irish. <laughs> Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved if our ushers would come forward and receive our morning tithes and offerings. wind and flame set us on fire this morning as we celebrate the explosion of your Holy Spirit coming into the world on the day of Pentecost. Remind us that the gift you gave that day was not just the gift to speak in different tongues, but also the gift of hearing and comprehension. May your Holy Spirit keep us attuned to the voices all around us to those who need us to be bearers of your love and your compassion. May these gifts we give help us through your church meet those needs. In the holy name of Jesus we pray, amen. Let's sing together, breathe on me, breath up. on but when they have it right it is nicely done I do invite you not just to come but to invite someone to come with you 
That's how people come, is by invitation. The scripture reading today is from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and were perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jew, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke, the sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. 
but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Jesus, we want to live like you. We know we cannot do that on our own. We need your mercy and your grace day after day after day. We confess our weakness. We continually give in to temptation. But rather than throw up our hands in failure, we choose to admit to you our constant need for you. Demonstrate your power through our weakness. You have defeated our sin by your death on the cross. Let us live in the truth of who we are in you not who we were before. Make us holy. Make us like you. Holy Spirit, what beautiful gifts you have given us. We are diverse, but unified. Body of believers in you. We are unique. Yet, even in our differences, we are one. Let us celebrate the gifts you have given each brother and sister here. We need each other. And so we ask you to help us love and support one another. Use each person here to further your kingdom and the good news of your kingdom. We are your hands your feet, your head, your heart, and more. Let us serve, walk, guide, love, and follow close to you. Lord, there are many of our body, many of our friends and family who are experiencing difficulties. Your grace is sufficient. And we ask you that your grace would go with them. We pray for Debbie's sister, Angie, still fighting the cancer, for Brenda fighting cancer, for Pascal as he enjoys his family time in Belgium. There are others we lift before you, Lord, knowing that you are the only thing that can help them. Help them to feel your presence and accept your grace in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us sing together, O breath of life.
Our scripture text this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all of these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. <clears throat> the human body is a marvelous thing, no doubt about it. But let's face us, some parts of our anatomy, anatomy are pretty useless, right? Like, who really needs those wisdom teeth? The appendix, pull it out. The pinky toe, great for chimpanzees, but not much particular use for human beings, except we'd look pretty weird without one when we're wearing flip-flops during the summer. So maybe the Apostle Paul's analogy for the church as a human body isn't such a great analogy after after all, what do you think? The Apostle Paul says in our text that the human body is one and has many members. And he asserts that in similar fashion, the body of Christ is one with many members. But does it have spare ribs? Not pork ribs smothered in barbecue sauce, human spare ribs. Fact is, about half a percent of us are born with spare ribs. Did you know that? While most people have 12 sets of ribs, one half of 1% of us have an extra set near the neck. As ribs, they're useless. Spare ribs. But superfluous bones are not the only oddities in the human body. Take your tonsils, for example. Ideally, these tissues at the back of the throat act as a filter for bacteria and viruses. Problem is, they're prone to infection, which is why so many are removed from the throats of young children. Fortunately for adults, tonsils shrink with age and generally, not always, but generally stop acting up. Wisdom teeth. Technically, these choppers are third molars that appear between the ages of 17 and 25, normally. Because they appear so late when we are much wiser than children, they're called wisdom teeth. But only about 5% of us have room for them. How many of you have had surgery on wisdom teeth? which means most of us do undergo oral surgery. Perhaps they once had value as backup molars, but today they're just a pain. Pinky toes, you know, your fifth toe, your little toe, your baby toe, 
maybe other names you use for it. Apes use all of their toes as they grab branches and swing from them. We don't do much swinging from our feet. Instead, we stand upright using our big toe and the next three toes for balance. The pinky toe is just for show. Finally, the appendix. The little worm-like tube at the end of your large intestine seems completely eh, since so many people have it removed. But recent studies suggest that it could be a storage place for beneficial bacteria. The bacteria you need in your body to fight bad bacteria. So maybe the appendix is actually useful, not useless. The Apostle Paul is writing to Christians who messed up royally, fussing with each other and who are generally dismissive of each other. They know nobody else does. They have about as much respect for others as we do for our baby toes. We're glad we have them. We'd look odd without them. But basically, we feel like they're useless. Paul grasps better than most that there is no such thing as a worthless member of the Christian community. In the body of Christ, there are no spare ribs. Paul's anatomy lesson contains important instructions for us as we celebrate Pentecost, the birthday of the church. One spirit, one Lord. He begins by reminding us that no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit tells them to. A pointed reminder that the one Holy Spirit is the source of every statement of Christian faith. In the body of Christ, there are many gifts, but they're powered by one spirit many ministries, but they honor the one Lord. Many activities, but the same God activates them in everyone. Whether you're an arm or a leg, a tonsil, a tooth, or a toe, your role in the Christ body is given to you by the one Holy Spirit of God that appeared on Pentecost and gave the apostles the unexpected and amazing ability to speak in other languages as well as other gifts. Not one, but a variety of languages. You saw that list of different countries that the Jews had gone to. They had lived there for centuries. They grew up knowing other languages, not Hebrew. But when they came to Jerusalem on their Jewish pilgrimage for the season of Pentecost, they heard the word spoken in their own language. The Holy Spirit gives a variety of gifts, ministries, activities, and languages in a variety of body parts. No one part is useless because all are spirit-powered. Problem is, we're human. We prefer uniformity. In congregations across America today, immigrants are still coming to church, just as they always have. But where previous waves of immigrants were largely European, these new arrivals are coming from non-Western countries with cultures and skin colors more alien to white Americans than most Europeans were. The missionaries that white American churches sent to Asia Africa, Latin America were successful beyond their wildest dreams. Those who heard their preaching are now coming to the United States and joining our churches here, whether it's because they're refugees like Burma or if they're making the choice to come. Frequently, these newcomers are more openly passionate about their faith than our native-born Americans. They bring a style that has roots in the very first days of Pentecost. 
but such worship can rattle traditional American congregations. One white member of a Presbyterian church in Virginia, after witnessing a spirit African style service in the church she had attended since 1955. If they want to worship that way, that's fine with me, but don't bring it to my church. Don't bring it into my sanctuary. Looking at her African brothers and sisters, she saw useless body parts, tonsils that weren't needed, teeth and toes, things that were spare, extra. Paul challenged us to accept the reality that to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Spirited African-style worship can enliven a traditional American service. English classes taught by Americans can help immigrants to communicate better and achieve success here in the United States. How many of you knew that Johnny's mother, I'm sorry, you're the closest thing to Johnny here right now, is in China teaching English as a second language? Senior citizens can mentor teenagers. Married couples can coach other couples. Children can draw pictures for residents of nursing homes. In each of these activities, we see the power of the Holy Spirit working for the common good. To circle back a bit, one of the clearest signs of the presence of the Spirit is variety. The different colors of red that we are wearing today speak to variety. Paul sees the Holy Spirit in the giving of wise advice. The message of special knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, the working of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, various kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Notice none of these is considered to be any greater than another. There is no hierarchy, and not one of them is useless. Instead, Paul says, all these are activated by one and the same spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. We need to emphasize these last five words, just as the spirit chooses. If the spirit chooses to activate a particular gift, service, activity, or person, who are we to judge that as unnecessary? The universal Christian church was born on Pentecost, and one of its fundamental characteristics is that it's one body with many diverse members. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, concludes Paul. We were all made to drink of one spirit. Relational ministry rather than transactional ministry one spirit, one body. That's the nature of our church, and it's posed challenges for the Corinthians just as it does for us. While there's no quick fix for divisions in the church, one place to begin to heal our fractures is to begin to see ministry as relational instead of transactional. So what's the difference? How am I using these terms? Transactional ministry looks at a person and asks, what can they do for us? Sing in the choir, teach a Sunday school class, put money in the offering plate, support the traditions of the church. Newcomers are welcome because of what they do in transactions that we see as beneficial. Relational ministry, on the other hand, looks at a person and sees a child of God. Newcomers are useful because of who they are, not because of what they do. We trust that they bring the gifts of the Holy Spirit with them, even though those gifts may be unusual to us, with new kinds of wisdom, new knowledge, faith, healing, 
and maybe even what seems to some to be miracles. When we welcome and include strangers as children of God, we're practicing relational ministry. Yes, they may bring their gift from the Holy Spirit among us, and it's our responsibility to let that happen instead of making them fit our box. Newcomers are accepted, fed, and supported because they are signs of the presence of Christ, not because they will give the church a competitive advantage in the religious marketplace. Welcoming congregations know that Christian hospitality creates life-giving connections, leading to deep spirited friendships. And when I say welcoming here, I mean welcoming of any child of God, not what we know today as simply welcoming and affirming. Ed Loring of the Open Door Community in Atlanta says that friendship brings to the other what no law of revolution can do, understanding and acceptance. Understanding how many of us ourselves and how many people we know and don't know need someone to understand what they're going through. How many of us, those we know and those we don't know, need that feeling of being accepted, of being a part of that's what people are looking for in the life of the church. And that's what they'll find in congregations that see the spirit at work in a variety of gifts, services, and activities. Our challenge is to widen our vision of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church today. The Christians in Corinth had a hard time seeing beyond their divisions in their church of a wealth spiritual gifts, and are so often we are blinded by local issues as well. But if we can look for signs of the Holy Spirit in all who come to church, we will begin to see the true unity of the body of Christ. Remember, says Paul, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one can pray, sing, study, or serve without being touched by the power of the Spirit. It's not to say that anyone is perfect without need for guidance, encouragement, and discipline. Far from it. We all need to be supported and held accountable. But at the same time, we be can begin to see each other in a new way not as vectors of hostility, but as vessels of God's own holiness. In a church with a variety of gifts, ministries, and activities, the Holy Spirit is always present in the wide range of people. One body, many members, and no useless parts. Let us pray. We thank you for your words to us, that there are no useless parts in your body. Sometimes we question what we are to use. Sometimes we don't know what the gift is. Open us to your Holy Spirit, that we will feel the nudge at the right time and be surprised by the words that come out of our mouth, by the actions that we do, because they come from you and not from us. Remind us always there are no useless parts in your body. Amen.
Let us sing together, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. called by God to be children of God. We responded in faith and received salvation. God has called us now to proclaim the good news. We believe that the gospel is true and that it has the power to change lives. Therefore, we will go and tell that others may know and believe. Thank you, God, for calling us, saving us, and sending us. We go now believing and proclaiming. Amen. Amen. 